just tuned in to Joy in the Word with beloved Bible teacher and author Pam Jenkins. This is Debbie Chambers, your co-host, and we're so honored that you would join us in the opening of God's Word. Today is going to be a marvelous day in the Word of God as Pam opens up the very pages that give us life and give us purpose. So let's join Pam now as she reveals the truth of the day. Right at the top of your note sheet, if you're taking notes, the age of the church because when we open up the first chapter of Revelation, and we did that together, it, it is the um, revelation or apocalypse of Jesus Christ, and which the Father gave to him. So it's not only just an unveiling of him, but it's an unveiling of God's heart and, and the Lord's heart for us and the Holy Spirit, for us to know and see the things and understand uh, what our future is. And so in chapter 1, we saw where Jesus was. It takes us to Jesus, and he is uh, moving in and out of the seven uh, lampstands, which are the seven churches, and it clearly tells us that. And uh, so then he says in chapter 2 to John, and we know that this is John the Apostle, uh, the, the, the one whom the, the Lord loved. And if you were in our John series, we just kind of went on to his next uh, writing, his epistle. For uh, We just moved on to another writing of, of what God gave him. And so John is writing the words that the Lord gives to him, what heaven shows him. And when you get in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he says, write to the churches. He begins chapter 2 that way. In our last time together, two weeks ago, we saw that this letter is to seven churches. And uh, let these seven churches are, and um, I'm going to show them to you on the screen. They are Ephesus, and we learned about Ephesus. And if you were in here, you know that Ephesus was the, was the church that had left its first love. They were the distant church from the Lord. They were the church that had grown distant in their relationship with him, their love for him. And so he tells Ephesus in the letter to Ephesus, you know, you've left your first love. So we have Ephesus, there's Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So tonight what I want to do, and I'm going to show you a map of, kind of to show you, we did this last time, but for those who weren't here, the map that I want to show you kind of shows you that all these seven churches, they were all close together. And then you'll see out in the water, that little Patmos, that little red dot is the island of Patmos. And that's where John was when he uh, received this message. And um, we have to understand that Revelation... It, it is a prophetic book, and prophecy does progressively unfold as you go through the book. And so many people think and have taught over the years, I've been taught this, and there are theologians and, and uh, evangelicals that believe that the seven churches progress just like prophecy does. And so the seven churches, as we progress through those, that the last church, Laodicea, will be what the church is like before the Lord comes back. I personally don't hold to that, and I'll tell you why. Because the every letter to the church, he says the same thing at the end of every letter to specific churches. If you have an ear, let, let you hear what he says to the churches, plural. And so these churches existed in John's day. So there was a Laodicea in John's day. So when we, even though Revelation progresses, I think these seven churches, I believe that it is a picture of the universal church as a whole, that any, any time in history, these seven churches are going to represent the struggles of the seven churches, uh, out of these seven churches. What are the struggles of the church? And a church today that you might be uh, going into or going visiting, and I have, um, we get to visit other churches, and uh, it, there's nowhere like home, I will say that. But when you go into other churches or in the church that you attend, because some of you come on Wednesday nights, you, you go to another church, um, you'll know, okay, from these seven churches, does my, where's my church fit? You know, what characteristic is, is uh, mostly 
connected to my church, to these seven churches. And so it's important for us to know these seven churches. And so what I have found since we did Ephesus, I want us to see, and it's about eight minutes and 50 seconds of a video that I think before I get into some points, because we're going to take the next um, four churches tonight and then save the last two for next week. Because the last two, the last two are unique. They're unique. And that's kind of where I want to put our focus, that first church and the last, but especially the last two. And you'll understand why next week. But for now, I think this is going to take us across the waters in this short video to the island of Pergamos and kind of set the stage for you. And for those of you who are thinking about going to, on the Greece teaching trip, this is really going to whet your appetite. So Brian's going to show this. The Greek island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea is a place of rugged beauty. The pace of life here is unhurried, a reminder of less complicated times. The inhabitants of these 32 square miles live peacefully in surroundings that are viewed by many as sacred. With a local population of about 3,000 people, there are some 400 churches on this tiny island. At the end of the first century AD, it was here that the biblical writer John saw the extraordinary visions that became the book of Revelation. He wrote down what he saw and sent it as a letter to seven churches in Asia Minor. Seven is the operating number, the perfect number all the way through the book of Revelation. It's a, a progressive unfolding of one seven after another, seven bowls, seven lampstands, uh, seven trumpets, so that the seven is, is dominating the book. It's a heavenly number. Letters are written to seven churches because instead of eight or nine or only five, because seven is a very significant number, especially in the Jewish world, the significance of which is inherited by the Christian church. And we see it reflected here in the book of Revelation. John is dealing with a situation in which these churches, some of them, not all of them, um, but some of them seem to be really accommodating to the Roman Empire, and he wants to stir them up and get them to be resistant. Walking along these quiet Aegean shores, you have little sense that the 21st century, with all of its technological wizardry, has arrived. Hello, I'm David Hume, and I invite you to journey along with us today as we investigate a centuries-old mystery a cryptic message that's still relevant today, though it was given to distant peoples a long time ago. Most people who come here to Patmos are seeking respite from the rush of everyday life. But despite outward appearances, this island speaks to the future of all humanity. For it was here that a series of apocalyptic visions was given. Our story begins over 1900 years ago when a lonely prisoner in Roman exile put down in writing images that have haunted the imagination ever since. It was the Apocalypse, or the Book of Revelation, the account of a remarkable series of visions from God given to a man named John. Today, most scholars say that he was simply John of Patmos, but some early traditions tell us that he was John the Apostle, the last surviving disciple of Jesus' original twelve. All the great themes are present, good and evil, reward and retribution, and the ultimate hope of peace and order beyond impending global chaos. A detailed presentation about this book would take hours, and we could only speculate about some of the future images contained in its pages. So in today's program, we're going to focus on some messages in the early part of the book, messages that are personal and that reflect Jesus Christ's concern for his people down through time. We'll review some vital messages given to those early followers in the first century and see what relevance they have for us today. What is forgotten is that these seven churches existed in the first century uh, almost side by side. And so they were faced with the same challenges or different challenges and problems then 
And I think uh, you don't have to be an expert in uh, church history to recognize that those kinds of problems, those kinds of challenges recur uh, in church history and are present uh, even today in the 21st century here and there around the world. Scholars believe that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation around 96 AD. John's perspective was unique. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had been present. He had seen the miracles. He had personally heard the parables and discourses from the lips of Jesus himself. He had seen the Son of God die a terrible death. Humanly speaking, John was closer to Christ than anyone. In fact, they had such a close relationship that Jesus asked John to care for his mother, Mary, after the crucifixion. In the years following Jesus' resurrection and the beginning of the New Testament church, John experienced something else, something shocking and disturbing. He watched in sadness as the initial enthusiasm of the church diminished. Though it grew in numbers, the church faced serious challenges. Some three decades before John's imprisonment on Patmos, the Roman emperor Nero had burned Rome, subsequently blaming the followers of Jesus, who were viewed as a sect of the Jewish faith. This false accusation led to extreme persecution, and many died horrible deaths. The spread of the church's influence led a later emperor, Domitian, to begin another round of persecution. According to the ancient Greek writer Philostratus, Islands such as Patmos were full of exiles during the reign of Domitian, and it seems that John was one of them. All of this is background to John's detention here. By the 90s AD, he was old and probably wondering how much longer he was going to live. He was no doubt concerned by the decline of the church and left pondering its future. It was then that the stirring but turbulent apocalyptic visions were given to him. It's often thought that the book of Revelation is John's message, but the introduction says otherwise. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. John was exiled to this Roman prison island because he refused to compromise his belief and practice as a follower of Jesus. Exile was a common punishment for those judged guilty of promoting what was thought to be a superstition. Exile could mean being cut off from family and friends for the rest of your life. In the first century, escape from Patmos was nearly impossible. The mainland was 14 hours away by boat. But in John's case, the Emperor Nerva, who succeeded Domitian, released all exiles in 96 AD. Once again, a free man, John wrote down the entire apocalypse and prefaced it with Jesus' personal message to each of seven churches. What's said in each of those messages is a combination of commendation, complaint, and correction. They're messages to people struggling to live according to Jesus' teaching and example. And that's why these messages to the seven churches are so relevant for us today. John, to the seven churches in Asia, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. But why were these seven churches singled out from all the other congregations in the Roman Empire? The seven cities mentioned in the book of Revelation likely symbolized all of the church at that time. Seven being a biblical number for completeness. The seven individual cities named were some of the largest in the Roman Empire. They were on what was probably an ancient mail route, a network of Roman roads. Letters were probably delivered following a circular route, beginning at Ephesus, going north to Smyrna and Pergamum, then southeast to Thyatira and Sardis, and along a major river valley to Philadelphia and on to Laodicea. From there, the route was completed back at the coast in Ephesus.
Did y'all like that? I thought that kind of kind of puts you in the scene of where John was. And there's only one cave on the Isle of Patmos, and they know that this is the cave where John uh, spent those years that he was exiled there. I have been in that cave, and I can tell you that you can feel God's presence in there in a mighty, mighty way. But Jesus was crucified in A.D. 30. We know that John received revelation around the time in the A.D. 90s, but he was able to leave that island in A.D. 96, so that tells you that he was on up there in age. It had been over 60 years since he had seen the face of the Lord. And this was a big deal when the Lord came to him. So what a, what a treat for, for John uh, to have been exiled and then actually get to have that encounter with Jesus to write the last book of our Bible. So what I want to do is I want you to write point number one. I want us to see the second church. We saw Ephesus, but we're going to go through four churches, and I'm just going to give you the highlights of these because I'm really, uh, in a week from, two weeks from tonight, we'll get into the rapture. And uh, just biblically, what does it teach us about that? Um, but the, the number one is the suffering church, the suffering church. We know that Ephesus was the distant church because they had left their first love. And remember, this is a picture of a whole. Seven is a universal number, but I think that this is just the characteristic of the whole of, of any church would fit into some of these categories. And, and what we can do is let me look at my life compared to these churches, because we are the church, but let me, let me look at the church that I'm in or that I, I'm visiting. We need to know the state of the church. It's important. It was important for God to, to, to know this, for us to know this. So the first church is Smyrna. It's the suffering church, and we begin our, our reading. Let me tell you just a little bit about Smyrna first. The, in Smyrna, emperor worship was greatly promoted and adhered to. You're going to treat the emperor as though they were God. And so you're going to worship the emperor. And they were persecuted. The people in Smyrna were persecuted by the Jews who lived there uh, because they thought, you know, you're pulling away from the Jewish tradition and, and Jesus isn't our Messiah. And so they had a war. And as long as you were connected, if you were considered the Jewish religion, then you didn't have to call the emperor Lord. You didn't have to uh, see them in that way and give them your worship. Laws protected the Jews, believe it or not. And so what the Jews did was they went because they persecuted the Christians. They hated the Christians. And so the Christians were left alone for a little while. But the Jews began to go and say, hey, they have nothing to do with our religion. And so the Jews were, uh, the Christians were greatly persecuted because of the Jews. They said, they're not part of us, so they need to call the emperor Lord. Well, the Christians wouldn't do that. They stood their ground. And so let me read you what he says beginning in verse 8, and now you'll understand why he's saying what he's saying to the church of Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. And when he says angel, this is the messenger or the representative. Would have been the leader, the earthly leader of the church at that time. It says, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. I know your tribulation and your poverty. They became poor there because they were cut off, because they wouldn't worship the emperor, and the Jews persecuted them, and they wouldn't do business with them. He said, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And again, same message as he ends all of the churches. If you have an ear, let hear what the Spirit says, listen, to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And that means judgment. When everyone is judged and all the nations of the world are judged, he said you won't be hurt by, by, by that death, which are those who will be cast, according to Revelation, we'll see this, into their eternity into the eternal lake of fire. So what can we, what was the word for this church? It says, I see you. I see you. 
I see every time you make a stand for me in that office or to that family member or out in the community or to your neighbor. I see the, the persecution or the lost friendships or the lost positions. I see the distance that people may put between you because you are a Christian and you do stand for your faith. I see your tribulation is what he's saying to them. Now, they suffered on a level that we haven't in America yet, but I believe it's coming. I believe it's coming. And for this church, we need to know, are we the suffering church? Are we the suffering church? Are we standing up and living our faith and refusing to bow the knee and let anyone else be the Lord over our life? Have we done that? That's a, that, that's a very convicting question. Really, who or what is the Lord of your life? Who do you bow the knee to? Is it yourself? Is it family? Is it peer pressure? Is it your job? Is it the world? He said, but I see you. I'm a, you know, he didn't correct this church for anything, by the way. He didn't get on to them, and, and his word to them is very short. So he says, be faithful. Do not be afraid of what's ahead of you. Because I know in our culture today and in the times in which we're living, even in America and what's going on around the world, <clears throat> it can be frightful. You know, my mother was talking about that to go and, and get to take care of my mother. Uh, is one of the days of the week I go is Wednesdays. And she was saying, you know, it'll just you just you just don't know what to think. I, you, you make you afraid when you watch the news and you see everything going on. Do you know before this church went into persecution, what he told them? And, and Smyrna did suffer greatly, the persecution um, under Nero and the others that followed. They lost their lives. They died gruesome deaths. And he said, don't be afraid for what's coming. Some of you are going to be cast into prison. And the 10 days has been questioned, was it 10 days? It was just a set period of time. What does that mean? Well, he really doesn't tell us. But what I do know about Smyrna is that it lasted a long time according to history. According to history. But the Lord sent word ahead of them saying, I see the struggle you're having. I see the tribulation. I see the persecution. He said, but don't be afraid of, of what you're about to encounter. And I don't know about you, but everything that's going on, I need to hear that. And then he says these sobering words, be faithful unto death. Wouldn't you want that on your tombstone? Wouldn't you want that to be true, to be put on your tombstone? He was faithful to the Lord unto death. She was faithful unto the Lord, to the Lord unto death. He said, no matter what comes, and they, he knew when he sent this letter to them, many of them would die because of their faith. And he said, but even in that last hour before you die, that martyr's death, be faithful to me. Don't renounce your faith. Don't turn away from me. Even in death, and this is what he says, he who overcomes, and he says, I will give you the crown of life. And then he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. You have an eternal future. So the second church, number two, we see the compromising church. We see the suffering church, and we see the compromising church. And some of you, and we can, especially if we think in, in terms of denominations, you can immediately say, you know what, I know. I know some denominations that have gone the wrong way. And so the next church, the compromising church, is Pergamum. And Pergamum was known for medicine. They had a medical library. And people would travel from all over the world to go to Pergamum because they wanted healing and they wanted medical treatments. And they would get on boats and they would travel for days just to get to Pergamum for healing. And Antipas, and you're going to read about Antipas to their, their, uh, their portion of their letter to them. Antipas is mentioned, and history records Antipas, especially if you've studied any of the martyrs or, or Fox's Book of Martyrs. Antipas is mentioned in there, and Antipas was the first martyr in this city in Pergamum. And he, he died a gruesome death for his faith in Christ. And the gruesome death was, history records for us that he was roasted slowly in a bronze kettle. He was roasted slowly in a bronze kettle. And you think, wow, 
would I have remained faithful unto death? And we get caught up in such trivial things. We complain and we grumble, don't we? I mean, say yes about yourself, not everybody else. Okay, say yes about you. Thank you. We can get caught up in all these, these trivial things, but I will say this, if we are worldly Christians or if we are just Christians on Sunday, if we're not serious about our commitment to Christ in life, we will not be serious about our commitment to Christ in death. We won't. And we can think, I can play church, and oh, I really do love Jesus, and I believe in Jesus. But if it comes to your persecution of your faith, and they say, I'm going to put you in a bronze kettle and roast you slowly to death if you don't deny Christ. If you're already denying him in your life, you'll deny him in the kettle. We will. This is why these letters to the churches are, listen, are so important to us because we think living for Christ is just coming to church on Sundays and giving our tithe or, 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 or serving in some capacity. That's not it. It's day in and day out. When I wake up, when I lay my head down in relationships and situations as I'm going and coming every day of my life and my conversations and my prayer time and my devotion, I, am I committed to Christ and everything? He says, be faithful unto death every moment of your life. Do you belong to me? Am I, are you all of mine? Do I have all of you every day of your life? Listen, and I, I, I want him to have all of me. And so Antipas is mentioned here in, in this letter of Revelation to the churches. And I thought Antipas' name, you know why God put him there? Because he was faithful unto death. He was faithful in the kettle. He was faithful when his, his, his following Christ cost him everything. You see, and today we really want, we don't want our faith to cost us anything. I, I don't want to have to give up anything. You see, Antipas is mentioned here, so let's read it. Verse 12 of Revelation chapter 2. And to the angel, to the messenger, the leader of the church of Pergamon, write these words. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. He's talking about, listen, he's talking about the word. The word. Hebrews teaches us that. He said, I know where you dwell. I know where you live. He said, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. Even when they were roasting Antipas in the kettle and many of you could have fled and denied your faith, but you remained true even in those days. He said, I know where you're living. I know the persecution. I know the hell that's breaking out in your city. And I know death has come. And he said, in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. I think we could put where Satan dwells for America in a lot of ways. He says, but I have a few things against you. A few. I mean, I'd be feeling pretty good if the Lord only said, I had a few things, <laughs> Pam, against you. He said, I, I have a few things against you. He says, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. He said, it's idolatry. He said, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. In short, this is pagan worship where immorality is part of their worship. You can live immoral and so, and, and, and it'd be an act of worship and you encourage others to do the same. I mean, that's, that's the culture we're living in. That's where we're living today. And he says, so you also have some who in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans or Nicolaitans, depending on who says it. If you're in the country, you say Nicolaitans. <laughs> the Nicolaitans, he, if you read in Acts, when they were choosing men, the apostles were choosing the group 
to help serve and take care of the sick and serve tables. You know, Stephen was one of them. Stephen was among them, if you know your church history, a little bit of Acts. And he was the first martyr of the church. They stoned Stephen to death. Well, a man by the name of Nicholas was chosen, and this is his following. So it is spread from Jerusalem all the way to Pergamum. And it's in, and it's in, that, you know, it was in Ephesus and the other churches too. And he started teaching that you can still have faith in Christ and indulge in pleasure, like not good pleasure. I'm not talking about eating an ice cream cone. <laughs> Sexual pleasure, drunkenness. You, you can indulge in these things and still belong to Christ. So just indulge yourself the personal life you want to live. And, and what, what the Lord is saying to this church is, your personal life, your public life, and your private life, your, your public worship and your private worship are important. They should match. They should match is what he's saying to this church. And then you say, well, what does he tell them to do? Well, I can't imagine hearing this. I mean, I used to hear it from my mama growing up. But to hear this from the Lord, therefore, because these things are true, you better repent, he says. Repent. And here's where, it, here's where it gets. It's like my mama said, or else I'm coming for you with the belt. He said, I'm coming to you quickly. And I will make war against you with the sword of my mouth. He said, there's consequences. There's consequences that will follow. He said, and again, he says, if you have an ear, you better hear what I'm saying to the churches. Hear what I'm saying. And he said, if you overcome, I'm going to give you some of the hidden manna. And I will give you a white stone and a new name written on that stone which no one knows but the one who receives it. So you say, Pam, what's the message to this church? You have compromised truth. You've compromised truth, listen, personally. And you have not stood for God's word. You've said, okay, we can do this, but we can give in here. And listen, the United Methodist Church has done that. We'll just, we'll just pull them out and, and, and we'll use that as an example. Okay, we'll hold to the Nicolaitans and saying, okay, you, you, you want to live this immoral lifestyle that God's word says is wrong, but we'll give you that and we'll be okay and we'll, we'll support that in the church, even though it's clearly against God's word. So then this is, this is not beating up on anyone or any lifestyle. But what are you saying? If you're the church, you're not the church if the word is not, is not living and active. You're not holding up my word. If you're not upholding my word, then you're not my church. And you better repent, he says, or I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. You can't, and you can't tell people, okay, it's okay to live the life that you want. Because God's word teaches the opposite of that. And today I have to ask the body of Christ, are we willing to stand up for truth and say, no, no, I don't say that's wrong. God's word teaches us that that's wrong. It could be abortion. It could be adultery. You know, many things. Are we, are we rooted enough in Christ to say, this is what God's word says and I have to uphold this. So let me give you a, a nugget right here. Uh, the life of compromise will suffer consequences from God. Have you compromised your faith, your commitment to Christ? Have you compromised anywhere? Listen, daily I have to check myself for this. Have I compromised anywhere? Have I compromised in my language? Have I compromised in my relationships? H have I compromised anywhere at all? It is, it, it could, could Jesus be with me 24-7 and be pleased with everything that I do and say? W would he be pleased if he were right there? And, and by the way, if you're in Christ, he is with you. Yes. Everywhere you go and everything you do. Would he be pleased? Would he be pleased? Because I, I know when I, when I step outside of, of pleasing him, outside of his will, his perfect will, his word, and listen, in conversation, in anything, in thought, in anything, immediately the Holy Spirit, boom. Boom. 
boom. You know, I've had my fleshly moments. Don't think the Bible teacher doesn't get all up in her flesh, because I do. I do. I, I had a moment, I had a moment with my neighbor. I had a moment with my neighbor. I have this neighbor that for years has just been on and on and on and, and doing things and sh spraying my shrub to kill it and cutting limbs and, 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 and cutting down things that are not his because he, I, I'm allergic to that, so I'm just going to cut all your bushes down. Who does that? that? That's me. I'm out in the yard going, who does that? Who does that? And then I caught him picking up lens from his yard just a couple of weeks ago and just in anger, hurling them into my yard, into my front yard. And I looked out my door. I won't say his name. I'll call him Tom. Tom, what are you doing? I can't believe that. And he was just hurling every stick, and he would go get them on one side of his yard and run to my yard and throw them over there. And I said, who does that? You're a Christian man. <laughs> And so, listen, this has been building for years. It's been building for years and building for years. Several, you know, years now. So not like it happened once. I'm, I'm setting up a defense for myself. And so he'll say, well, your branches or your bushes, you know, they're, they're kind of curved this direction. And so when the rain comes, it pours water off of them. And so there's a huge oak tree in the back, and, and those limbs, they come over my back driveway, and so it dumps a mound of leaves. And so what, what my neighbor does on my trees, he'll blow all, if any, I don't care if it's two leaves on his yard, he'll bring those two leaves because it's your tree. Well, I never said anything about his tree. So a storm came by, and there was this big old limb. It fell from his tree, from Tom's tree. <laughs> I had a moment of non-Christianity. <laughs> I had just caught him throwing the limbs. Now, listen, been over there face to face, asked him not to do it. You know, the chief of police has gone over there and just said, hey, don't do this. But he still does it. He's crazy. <laughs> but listen, this is the way I asked for it. The consequences follow, Tom. I picked up that limb. It was a big old limb. I hurled it into his yard, and I said, there you go, Tom! There you go! And listen, but you know what? You know what? I'm so ashamed of my behavior. I had a mad moment. I'll be 61 this year. I think you earn some rights the older you get. And it's, listen, as soon I could hear the Holy Spirit saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it! There you go, buddy! I was just had had it with him. And as, listen, as soon as I let that go, I wanted to climb the fence and take it back. But I couldn't. I, I couldn't get over it. But what I'm saying is, listen, our behavior, even when we are antagonized, doesn't justify behavior. It doesn't justify limb throwing. It doesn't justify that. And so, I mean, my sins are stupid things like that, where my flesh gets the better of me. I'm not out partying and drinking and all of that stuff, you know, but like in my pre-Christ days. But listen... I can be just as sinful as my pre-Christ days. I can. Just my flesh. And he says, your public commitment to me and your private commitment to me are important to this church. It's important. A life of compromise will suffer consequences. Listen, I had to repent of that. I felt so bad. And I, I had wind fire coming up. I thought, Lord, don't block the flow of where I go. You know, I have to stay clean with him because of speaking and, and people wanting to receive God's message. You're the same way. You're a vessel, and we have to keep it clean. And when we do mess up, we got to go and pour that out and repent of it. He said, if you'll repent of it, I'll forgive you, and I'll, I'll fill you fresh. 
I won't beat you up on it. So church number three, I hope y'all still love the teacher. Always. <laughs> number three, shows you your teacher ain't perfect. The church that tolerates sin. The church that tolerates sin. We have the church that compromises truth. They're not, okay, it's okay. If you don't like that part of God's word, they make it a buffet, a smorgasbord. You just pick out what you want. Or the suffering church. But this church, Thyatira. Thyatira was the church that tolerates sin. It tolerates sin. And we'll read why. It says, And to the angel, verse 18, of the church of Thyatira write, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. I mean, he starts off, boom, with this church. And his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now listen, this is a, not the Jezebel in the Old Testament, but it is that teaching of Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Listen, in, as you travel in ministry, I, I've never had a man come to me and say they were a prophet and had a word for me. But I've lost count of the women. I have. I have, I have my, our staff can attest to that. I, I have lost count of the prophetesses that have come to me calling themselves a prophetess and having a word for me. See, the Holy Spirit will speak to me. I, I Listen, I don't despise prophetic utterances, but a prophet usually speaks either to a person that it affects the whole nation or to a nation. And today we have God's Word and we have the Holy Spirit. So you, got, you have to be careful of who comes and speaks to you things. And it says, but you tolerate this woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. It said, I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her in a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her, listen, into great tribulation. You say, will we all be here when the tribulation happens? And we're, we're going to find that out. But I know that this is the one church characteristic that talks about the great tribulation. Unless they repent of her deeds, and it says, I will kill her children with pestilences, that's disease. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. He says, but I say to the rest of you who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call themselves, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, he says, hold fast until I come. Hold fast until I come. He said, he who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father, and I will give him the morning star. Listen, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Pam, what's the lesson for this church? Sin cost Jesus his life on the cross. Deal with sin. Don't take sin in your life lightly. Don't take it lightly. Unrepented sin, he says, judgment will come. Don't take sin lightly. We can make jokes and talk about things that we shouldn't and behaviors and gossip and telling lies and little things like that. And we just, we take those things, we can take those things lightly. And he says, don't take sin lightly especially if you're allowing it, people to come in and to, to, to teach a sinful way of living, that that's okay. We should never be okay with that. John MacArthur says this. Let me give you this quote, and then we'll get to our last church tonight. John MacArthur said, We should not be entertained by the sins for which Christ died. I love this quote. I've used it in the past. I love it. 
We should not be entertained by the sins for which Christ died. And, and let, me, let me ask you this question as we're going into the next church, our last one for tonight. When you sin, does it prick your heart? Do you, do you feel convicted? It's that little shame or guilty feeling. You say, well, we're not supposed to feel guilty. Sure we are. In Christ, we're forgiven, but if we do something wrong, we should feel guilty slash convicted. You say, Pam, are they the same thing? They're, they're pretty similar. Uh, guilty, is, guilty is you feel you know you did something wrong. Conviction is, okay, that's from the Holy Spirit, so I know that's wrong, but conviction is going to say, I, you need to repent, you need to make it right. You can go on and live in guilt, but conviction pushes you to repent and to stop the behavior, to correct it. The last church that I want us to see is the church that is dead. The church that is dead, and I'll go ahead and tell you, this is Sardis. And the way that I remember this is sardine. It's a dead <laughs> church. Sardis was like a sardine. It's a dead church. It's a dead church. So we have the church that is dead, we have the church that tolerates sin, the church that compromises truth, and the suffering church, the church that is suffering for their faith. But this church that is dead, Sardis was a church that was spiritually dead. I'm going to give you some good points about this church, but he tells us in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these words, he who has the seven spirits of God, and listen, that's the completion. Isaiah talks about this, and we'll, we'll, I'll teach this a little bit later, but it's coming. But it's just the, they're not seven Holy Spirits. There's one spirit, but it's the completion of wisdom and knowledge and mercy and all those things. He says, and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive. Listen, people know, Woo! have you been to that church over there in Sardis? I have heard of them. They have a name, they have a reputation, so they've made a name for themselves. And he says, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you are dead. Wow. That's happening in church over there. Yeah, but you're dead, he said. Wake up. Wake up. Strengthen those things that remain. What you have left is what he says, which we're about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. You have incomplete assignments because you've been busy with all this other stuff. You haven't completed the assignment, listen, which for all of us is the gospel. We can be sidetracked into all these other things. And we say, okay, how are we getting out the gospel message as a church? So you have incompleteness in your assignments. You've got all these things happening, and they look great. You're the happening church. You've got a name for yourself. And he says, therefore, he says, so remember what you've received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. These are the people, this is the church, the body of Christ, that's not going to be ready when he comes or when we're raptured. We're not going to be ready. Because we're going to be busy. We're going to be busy, but not in His will, not about His will, not about the Father's business. doesn't matter if you have a name for yourself. doesn't matter how many people know Pam Jenkins' name or your name or a church's name, a pastor's name, a ministry's name. We can be as dead as a sardine and still have a name. Still have a name. He says, but you have a few people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk in white with me, for they are worthy. He says, he who overcomes will be clothed with white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess, and listen, this is not the Lamb's book of life. You can't, I'm not, this isn't teaching that you'll lose your salvation. If that's what you believe, then let me give you some scriptures and help you understand that a little better. 
The book of life are those who've been recorded in the book of life of deeds. It's going to be opened up and your deeds are going to be, as Christians, we, it's, it's a fallacy to believe that we're not going to give an accountability just because we're in Christ. That's God's word teaches the opposite. In fact, Jesus even taught, you're going to give a, a, an accountability for every careless word you've ever spoke. But our deeds, we're going to have to give an accountability. And he said, I'm not going to erase those things that you did exist as if you didn't make a difference in life. And he says, I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. If you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, to the churches. You see, despite their Sardis's reputation of life, Jesus saw them for what they really were. In other words, they're that Christian, that, that body of Christ that makes a big splash, hallelujah, when they come in the room. On the outside, they look like they're really loving Jesus. They look like they're really loving Jesus. They're doing all these things for Jesus. But I want you to understand this. He says, but you are dead. Those words, but you are dead, shows that a good reputation is no guarantee of true spiritual character. Despite their good appearance, Jesus saw them as dead. Listen, there was no struggle, no persecution, no fight, none of that, because they didn't have any spiritual depth or spiritual life. They, had, they were active. But hear this line. It wasn't that the church at Sardis was losing the battle. A dead body has already lost the battle. Let me say that again. They were dead, remember, spiritually dead. It wasn't that the church at Sardis was losing the battle, means spiritual battle. Said a dead body has already lost the battle. So let me give you a nugget right here as we begin to close out our time. Sardis was a perfect model of inoffensive Christianity. Inoffensive Christianity. We don't offend. We have all these great things going on, but we don't offend because we don't address sin. We don't address the things that are wrong. We don't invite you to walk deeper with Christ, or we don't talk with you and confront you about sin and love. We don't ask and call for repentance for our nation, for our world. We'll use our social platforms to promote ourselves and pictures of ourselves all day long, but not the gospel, not the truth. He said, so you might, you might have a lot going on in your life, and people might say, whoo, they, they've got a lot going on. They look like they have a great life. But there is no spiritual depth there that I see. There's no, there's no message about Christ coming forth from your life. This was Sardis, the dead church. Winston Churchill said, said to Britain in the early days of World War II, I must drop one word of caution, for next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness is the worst of wartime crimes. Slothfulness and neglect, overconfidence. We got all these works. We got all these works. Sardis thought they were good. If I just wrote out to you everything that I'm doing for the Lord and everything that's going on, we're the happening church. I mean, we got building programs, we got activities, we got something for every age. You can come in but they were as dead as they could be. So is your life filled with busyness for the Lord, but not with the Lord? Would somebody want your Jesus based on your lifestyle? Would somebody know that you were truly committed to him based on your conversations, based on your thoughts? based on your private life? Is the word of God really the law that you live by? Or have you compromised there personally? You know, he already knows it. These letters are to us. Which church so far could you identify the most with? Or maybe it's more than one. You see, as a church, he has a word to us. 
Your faith is your life. Your life is your faith. If you follow me, if you say you're a Christian, your life should show that. You've got to live different, privately and publicly. You've got to live different. And sin should bother us personally. Listen, if it doesn't bother us personally, it's certainly not going to bother us when the world is living loose. Revival starts with us. We want a change in this country. It's got to start with us. We've got to start cleaning out. We've got to start throwing away, getting rid of those things that he says, tear them off, rip them off from your life that you have to let go of. But he, he ends with the same warning seven times in a row, he says it. He who has an ear, let him, her, hear what I'm saying to the churches. Hear what I'm saying. Because he's saying it for us. The hour is growing very dark. Meaning our time is winding down. I don't want to give my life to worldly things. Not to the pleasures that I want to give it to. I want to give it to him. I want to take as many into heaven as I can because I know there's a second death coming. And I don't want those to be hurt by the second death eternally separated from God. That ought to be my burden every day that I wake up. And if that's my burden, I'm going to live a life that people know, okay, she's real. She really does believe in Christ. He really is her Lord. Even when she hurls a lamb over the fence and shouldn't have done it, she repented. If I could have fetched it back, I would have. Sin should bother us, right? So, we have two churches left. Listen, these are the big ones. And I want to give them to you, and then we'll get into the rapture. And we'll be diving into these things, these wonderful things of Revelation. You've been listening to Join the Word with beloved Bible teacher and author Pam Jenkins. Here at JBOP Ministries, we're so honored that you would join us for the reading of God's Word. We pray that today's message has been an encouragement to your soul. Join us next time for Join the Word with Pam Jenkins. God bless y'all.